Tigers. There was once a Sufi who was the companion of a certain king. The king said to him, I cannot understand your philosophy, but also I cannot help admiring Sufis as the most interesting people whom I ever meet. The Sufi said to the king, Tell me one of your difficulties in understanding. The king said, How, for instance, can a sound affect a person, especially a cultivated person, more than a word? Any animal can make a sound. Words are a higher form of utterance, surely. The Sufi said, When you are in a suitable condition, I shall demonstrate to you what this may mean. Now, one day, the Sufi and the king were on a tiger hunt. The king, who was a most talkative person, would not keep quiet and repeatedly forgot not to raise his voice. Tiger after tiger was frightened away. The hunter who was with the party at length came to the Sufi while they were resting, bowed low and said, When skill and repute fail, it is said that the only recourse of man is to the wise. Could your presence not perhaps prevail upon his majesty to remain silent when we are stalking tigers? This unworthy individual craves your help, for if we do not bring back a tiger from this hunt, it is I who will get the blame for the king's own shortcoming, and my wife and children, as well as my reputation as a hunter, will suffer. The Sufi agreed to help the hunter. When they had caught up with the king again, he saw that the monarch was still talking. Then the Sufi said softly, Tai. At once the king was as silent as a grave, and he whispered so low that even a tiger could not have heard. Gurs? The Sufi said, Now that your majesty has deigned to become silent for a moment at the sound Tai, and even contributed the nonsensical sound Gurs? Allow me to say that such words as please be quiet or if we talk we shall scare the tigers away or even hush have had no effect all day on someone who claims that words are superior to sounds. Furthermore, please note that people generally know very well what other people mean. I cannot understand may be composed of words but it does not really mean anything once we test it. I have just tested your... I do not understand what you mean by your philosophy. Unsolved Two worthies of the land of fools heard that someone called the Polite Man was visiting their capital. Desiring to meet him, they went to the city's main square. Here they saw a stranger sitting on a bench. Do you think that it's him? one asked the other. Why don't you go and ask him? The first man went up to the stranger and said, Excuse me, but are you the polite man? The stranger answered, If you do not leave me alone, I'll smash your face in. The inquirer went back to his companion. Well, was he the man we're looking for? I don't know. He didn't tell me. Guru, the perspicacious mouse. One evening, a mouse named Guru was scampering through a house when he heard the sound of children crying. Feeling sorry for them, and also being quite inquisitive, he stopped. He saw a sad sight. The father of the family was trying to light a fire, but the wood was damp. Can I help you? said the mouse. The man was too worried to be very surprised at being spoken to by a mouse, so he just said, If you have straw, you can help me. I must feed these children, but there is no kindling to start the fire. So Guru ran to his nest and brought the man several pieces of dry straw. Soon the fire was blazing and the children were being fed. 
They were all happy. I am a real benefactor, said Guru, and I deserve something for this. Of course you do, said the man. He promised to tell his children the story of Guru the Mouse, the great benefactor, who appeared as if by magic and gave them just what they needed. Fame is wonderful, said Guru, but I want something more tangible as well. So the man gave him a large piece of freshly baked bread. Guru carried it away. Usually it took him days to collect as much food as this, and all for a few wisps of straw. Wonderful. He decided to follow up any sign of human beings in distress in future, in case it might prove profitable. Already he saw himself as an individual with a special mission. The very next morning, he was creeping along the floor of the house next door when he heard some children crying. Guru scampered up to them. Children, what is the matter? Our father is a tinsmith, said one of the little ones, and he has gone to his shop to try to earn some money to buy food for us. But we are hungry, and that is why we are crying. Guru had an idea. I have some bread, he said, and I will give it to you. What can you give me in exchange? When he carried the bread to the children, they were overjoyed and said, Take this tin cup. We are sure that our father would want you to have something in return for such a kind action. Guru took the cup, and as he dragged it away, he called back at them, Remember Guru the perspicacious mouse and what he did for you. But by then the children were fed and laughing, and all the more so to see a mouse pulling a tin cup. Never mind, said Guru to himself. It is not how it looks to others, but what it looks like to me. I have proved that I am a benefactor. Have I not just given away several days' food in return for a piece of metal? He had to take the cup out through the front door of the house because it was too large to get into his hole from inside. As he was manoeuvring the cup under the large crack in the doorstep, he heard an argument in the dairy across the road. Guru left his cup and went to see what it was all about. He found the dairyman trying to milk a cow into his shoe. In this way, he lost a lot of the milk as he carried it to the pail. "'What are you doing?' shouted Guru. "'My milking pail has rusted away,' said the dairyman, "'and this pail is too high to get under the cow, "'so I am using my shoe as a milking pail.' "'You are losing a lot in that manner, friend,' said the mouse. "'Supposing I were to give you a nice new shiny cup, "'would you like that?' Very much, said the milkman. So Guru gave the man the cup, and he was able to finish the milking easily. Soon he had forgotten Guru, and the mouse ran up to him as he was leaving the dairy. What about my share? he cried. The man began to laugh. You are only a mouse. I have got the milk, and I have put the cup out of your reach. You cannot have anything. It is bad business to do something without first having a contract. But there was a verbal contract, protested Guru. Then take me to court, laughed the man. Who would believe you? Just for that, stormed the mouse. I will demand your cow in payment. No, nothing less. Ho, ho, roared the dairyman. All right, then. If you can take the cow away, you can have her and he staggered out of the dairy with tears of laughter rolling down his cheeks. As soon as the man had left, Guru spoke to the cow. Listen, mother, you heard what your owner said. I am your master now. You must follow me and treat me as you did him. That sounds fair enough, mooed the cow, providing that you give me somewhere to stay and something to eat when I need it. You must also milk me when I need it. We will attend to those details when we come to them, said Guru. But meanwhile, you must follow me. 
and he led the cow out of the dairy, holding on to the end of her rope. Of course, he could not get the animal into his tiny hole, so he decided to head for the open country to see what fate might have in store for him. Before very long, he found that the cow was leading him because she kept on straying from one patch of juicy grass to another. The mouse had become so important in his own eyes, however, that he said to himself, Since I have no real home now, any direction is better than none. This being so, we cannot truly say that the cow is leading me. What counts is who holds the free end of the rope. In this way, the cow pulled the mouse farther and farther into the countryside. Some of the people whom they met were amused, some amazed, and Guru soon became clever enough to cry out whenever a cow herd was seen and to shout, That's right, keep on! Or, Good, turn left here! Just after the cow had made some move or other. But the cow was becoming a real burden. For one thing, the mouse could find little food to his taste in the pastures favoured by the cow. Furthermore, there was always the threat of milking time, and he had no answer to that. As he was thinking about this, while still calling out, Good, stop here, and Fine, just finish up that tuft of grass, he saw a small group of soldiers camped in a glade. The cow and the mouse stopped near to them, and Guru asked them what they were doing. If a mouse can understand, said the leader, we are a special group of the king's guards. As we have not been paid for months, we are on the point of mutiny. And to top it all, we have been given the chore of escorting that princess over there in the sedan chair to her father's summer capital for the hot weather. No ordinary mouse, if you please, said Guru with a courtly bow which quite impressed the soldiers. I am Guru the Perspicacious, of whom you may have heard, under various names, such as the Mouse with the Cup, the Giver of Bread Mouse, the Fire-Making Mouse, and so on. And what can you do for us? asked the Chief of the Soldiers, for we have a fire and nothing to drink out of a cup. Furthermore, you do not appear to have enough bread with you to suffice us. My benefactions, said Guru, are always based upon exchange, for this is a system which has stood me in good stead. It might almost be said that I have discovered the principle that all things work by exchange. We have nothing to give you, said the soldiers altogether. But you have, said Guru, give me your burden, the princess. Then you can desert, sell your arms, eat or sell the cow, and generally rearrange your lives. Desertion is a serious crime against our lord the king, said the first soldier. No mouse ever owned a cow, said the second soldier. It would be nice to be free again, said the third soldier. What has the cow got to say about it? asked the fourth soldier. I want to know more about all things work by exchange, said the fifth soldier. But the leader said, This seems like a strange and probably beneficent intervention of fate in our lives. Men, we shall take the cow for I refuse to bear this hardship any longer. So they took the cow, milked her, and had a drink, and they disappear from our story. The mouse sat politely outside the palanquin for some time, and finally the princess drew the curtain. Seeing that the soldiers were gone, she began to weep, for they were in the middle of a wilderness. Your Highness said Guru, you are now my bride. By virtue of the principle discovered by me and continuously and successfully applied, known as all things work by exchange. This is absurd, said the princess. Mice do not talk. 
If they do, they don't know anything about principles. If they do, they cannot exchange things for king's daughters. Life is better arranged than that. But the mouse, by patience and sweet talk, and because there seemed no alternative to his version of the affair, made the princess follow him to a hole under a rotten tree, which he had espied during his talk with the soldiers, and considered to be a safe and pleasant bridal home. And to the home of Guru the Benefactor, he said to his bride. You may be very clever, said the princess, but you have forgotten that a human being cannot enter a mouse hole. Then you can stay outside, said Guru, rather annoyed. Sleep under that brushwood. But I must have food. You can eat those carrots growing in that field. I am a princess, not a gnawing animal. I need sugar plums and delicate things to eat. All things work by exchange, said Guru, and if you need those things, you will have to gather wild fruits and take them to market. Sell them and buy what you need. The next morning at dawn, the princess awoke and started to collect wild fruits. She made a bundle from her veil, and she and Guru started off for the market, which was in the city where her father ruled. As they entered the city, the princess began to cry, Buy my wild fruits, for I have to have sugar plums. All things work by exchange. My bridegroom will give me none. The king, hearing his daughter's voice, sent out a party of his guards to bring her to the palace. The mouse concealed himself, and when she appeared in the audience chamber, he stepped forward. Great king, father-in-law, greeting, I claim my bride. By what right is she your bride? asked the king, although he had already heard of the tale from the princess. By the right of the immutable law, all things work by exchange. You got this city by an exchange of lives. You protect the people, they give you money in exchange. If a mouse starts to exchange, everyone mocks and says it is impossible. I appeal in the name of the unchangeable law. Flout it if you dare. The king turned to his ministers, who counselled him. Majesty, although we have never before heard of this law, upon reflection we cannot see any case which does not fit it. We therefore conclude that it is indeed a hitherto unobserved but nonetheless immutable law. Is there none who will deliver me from this opinionated mouse? The king cried in anguish, and all the more so because the doctors of the law were looking upon Guru as someone who, having produced a new law, might present them with another one at any moment. Then a certain dervish, who had been at the court for many years, but had never spoken except in riddles, stepped forward and whispered into the king's ear. The monarch's brow cleared, and he announced, The doctors of the law have spoken well, and the dervish has spoken well. Cause the mouse guru to be proclaimed my son-in-law by virtue of the great immutable law of all things work by exchange. This law is henceforward to be applied throughout my realm. It will first be tested in this our court. Then the king called Guru to come forward and seat himself beside him. Guru ran up the steps of the throne and started to perch on the brass platter beside the king. But under this was a brazier and Guru was badly scorched. He appealed to the king, How can I sit there, O king, for it is too hot for me? It is the custom of this country that the son-in-law must sit beside the king. This is his place. He picked up the mouse and held him over the heat. In a few seconds, Guru felt as if he were roasting and cried out, who will exchange this terrible heat for the hand of a king's daughter? I will take it back, said the king, and he let the mouse go. Guru scampered away as fast as he could until he had quit the land. 
You gave me advice, said the king to the dervish, and in exchange I bestow upon you the hand of the princess. For after all, is it not a law that all things work by exchange? Will it work? Once upon a time, there was a man who decided that he was wasting his life by having a house, a car and a job. So he gave them up. Then, instead of having somewhere to live, something to get him around and something to do, he only had to worry about which hedge he slept under, whether he had corns on his feet, and whether he was doing his ritual mantrams and wearing the right spiritual clothes and eating the latest miracle foods. But things still didn't seem right. Then he came across a really wise man, and to him he said, I feel I've been wasting my life, because since I stopped wasting my life by conventional activities, I have just carried on unconventional but equally stereotyped spiritual ones. I can tell you what to do, said the really wise man. You should stop relying on chance, dress and diet. Stop imagining that music, incense or dancing, horoscopes, books of divination or perfumes, crazy companions and so on will do you any good if you want to have knowledge. Marvellous, gasped the disciple. And will this make me truly wise? No, said the wise man. But in comparison to what you were like before, you automaton, it will seem like it. Alim the Artful From Badakhshan to Sarandib from Marrakesh to Zanzibar, among the Bedouin and the Kochi, wherever the palm tree has been carried, and wherever it will not take root, you will hear of the fame of Alim the Artful. While there is still a sultan's palace upon this earth, the tales of Alim the Artful will be told and retold, because to tell a tale of Alim is to bring the shadow of the celestial Humai bird with honour and good health upon the teller. And when there is no palace of a sultan, fortune and success will descend upon the hearers as well as the tellers of the tales of Alim. Alim the artful, blessings upon his memory. How Alim bought an orchard. Now Alim was born in Pahman, the smiling land of the Afghans, where the fruit is so delicious that people have been advised not to eat it, in case, travelling elsewhere, they might feel the unworthy sentiments of despair and dislike by contrast. Alim was in Pagman when he heard that there was an orchard for sale. The man who told him said, Alim, you are so cunning that it is said you can make a demon believe that it is a fairy. You always help people. Will you go to the owner of the orchard and use your golden tongue to get it for me at a very low price? And he pressed a sum of money into Alim's hand to pay for the orchard. Now this man was a greedy and unworthy individual whom Alim decided was not fit to have the orchard. He went, nevertheless, to see the owner, and spent some time with him. Presently he came past the house of the greedy man, who said, Alim, how did the matter fare? Alim said, the deal is done, and the other man jumped for joy. Alim continued, I talked and talked and talked. The man at first wanted a high price, then I got it down. Then I got it down again, and again. Then I made him reduce the price by a number of criticisms. Then I suggested that I might want it for the Khan, who, as you know, is a Sayyid, and so he reduced it again. And then I told him that I understood that there might be a new tax on orchards. And he went on in this vein for some time, while the greedy man became more and more excited, and, unable to contain himself, shouted, how much did you get it for? Less than one-tenth of the price which you were offering, which was itself niggardly enough, said Alim. My dear, dear friend, how can I ever thank you? asked the greedy man. I must reward you with something like uh, one half of a percent of the amount. You have already rewarded me enough, said Alim. And how is that? 
Well, it was the memory of your frugality which kept me going through all that bargaining. If you say so, I shall certainly not press you, said the greedy man. In fact, said Alim, I was so obsessed by your need to save money that I saved all your money in case you had second thoughts. What do you mean, saved all my money? Quite simple. When the price had gone down almost to nothing for that very valuable orchard, I thought, my friend has now saved so much on this deal that it would only be poetic for him to save it all. And so I bought the orchard for myself. Here is your money back. How Alim Became a Thief Alim the Artful travelled to Samarkand to find that matters were such that all the honest men were in jail and all the thieves had become rich, famous and respected. Because of the corruptness of the Khan and the example of the court, the scholars were thieves, the merchants were thieves, the soldiers were thieves and the officials were thieves. Of course, because of their dishonesty, they called themselves the elect. Alim said to himself, If all the honest men are in jail, then I will become a thief. A thief who knows that he is one must surely be better than one who does not. Furthermore, has it not been said that In a rose garden be a rose, in a thicket be a thorn? A thief, Alim thought, should start somewhere. Since I have the option, I shall become thief to the Grand Khan. He went to the palace by dead of night and found the treasury, but there was nothing in it. The Khan knew his own people so well that he had hidden his wealth in a safe place. Search as he might, Alim the Artful could not find anything of value. So he returned to his caravanserai and kept his ears open. The merchants, who regularly used the serai, talked among themselves of the collection of emeralds which the Khan was amassing. Nobody knows where he keeps them, said the merchants to one another, but he must keep them somewhere, and since nobody can be trusted here, they must be somewhere near him. Quite right, said Alim to himself. Although he was artful, his maxim was, Artfulness is not only used, it is learnt. So, a few nights later, he was in the palace again, this time by the Grand Khan's bedside. Alim sat down on a stool near the Khan's head and started to stroke his forehead. Then he said, Can you hear me, Great Khan? After a few repetitions, the Khan started to answer him. The Khan said, What is it? Alim said, "'Where do you keep the collection of emeralds?' "'Now, fellow,' said the Khan, still in his sleep, "'do you really expect me to tell that to a rude fellow "'whom I meet in the street, "'even if he is cooling my brow for me with a fan?' "'Assuming another voice, Alim said, "'Away, ruffian! Can't you see the Khan wants to talk to me about his emeralds?' "'But the Grand Khan was not to be drawn "'and refused to say anything to Alim after that.' The next night, Alim tried again. Sitting beside the Khan, he said, Your emeralds have been stolen. Don't talk nonsense, said the Khan. But since Alim did not say any more, the thought rolled backwards and forwards in his mind in his sleep. While Alim sat there silently, the Khan called out to the Khanun in the adjoining room. Malika, have you the emeralds safe? The Khanum answered, Yes, of course, they are under my bed, as they have always been. So the Khan, muttering, Stupid oaf, slipped into a relieved and profound slumber once more. Alim the Artful waited until the Khanum's breathing showed that she was deeply asleep, and then he slipped into her room and took the emeralds. That night he gave them to an honest man, whom he had met in the Sarai, who had escaped from prison. This man slipped from the city before it was searched by the furious Khan's men, who practically demolished every house looking for the treasure. The criers shouted the royal proclamation in the street 
that theft always leads to disgrace and destruction, and the emeralds must be returned forthwith. Since the people were muttering against the Khan and all his works, nobody noticed anything unusual about Alim's saying whenever he heard the criers, Since theft has become the order of the day here, how can it be dishonourable? Now the Khan called the wisest man in all the land to advise him how to catch the thief, even if he could not get his emeralds back. We must make an example of him, otherwise he will become more and more audacious, said the Khan. He added, You, wisest men in all the land, will, I am sure, provide a perfect trap. But, just to hasten matters, I will have you put in a dungeon until you work one out. How Alim proved that he was a doctor. The soldiers of the Khan, while this was going on, were searching the city for strangers, because the people had been intimidated for so long that it was the Khan's belief that the thief must be a foreigner of some kind. It was thus that they came upon Alim the Artful in his caravanserai, and, unsatisfied by his claim that he was a doctor, carried him before the Grand Khan. "'Are you a doctor?' asked the Khan. "'Indeed I am, a special kind of doctor,' said Alim. "'Then you must cure someone at once, "'or we'll put you to the torture to see whether you are the thief,' said the Khan. "'Like all doctors I have my rules,' said Alim, "'for he had hit upon a plan. "'Abide by your rules so long as you do not decline to treat a patient.' said the Khan. My rule is that I should be allowed to select the patient. You may certainly do so, providing that there is quite obviously something wrong with him, said the Khan. Nothing easier, said Alim. Do you see that blind man over there? I elect to cure him. That would indeed prove that you are a very special kind of doctor, said the Khan, for he is my son-in-law and has been blind in both eyes for twenty years. "'Get ready for the cure,' said Alim, advancing towards the patient. "'Your Highness,' murmured the Grand Vizier in alarm into the Khan's ear, "'don't forget that your daughter is so ugly that you had to find a blind man to marry her. "'Now if his sight should be restored—' "'Enough!' shouted the Khan. "'Throw this man Alim out. He is no longer under suspicion.' "'How Alim made his first disciple?' Now Alim the Artful thought that he would lie low for a while, just in case the Khan had second thoughts about him. So he returned to his native glens. In Kabul he was munching dried white mulberries and nuts, having spent his last penny, when he thought he would try to collect some capital. He saw a man coming past the Chaikhana where he was sitting, and called out to him, "'Friend, give me some money.' "'I haven't got any,' said the man. "'Well, give me something, a gift, or even a piece of advice. "'I haven't either.' "'What is your name?' asked Alim. "'I'm called Chuch the Thin,' said the man. "'Chuch the Thin? You haven't much to lose. "'Would you like to become a disciple? "'What is your path?' "'The Artful Path. "'I am none other than Alim the Artful.' Well, said Chuch the Thin, I haven't heard of your Tarika before, but it may be a secret and therefore a powerful one. I'll join you. So Chuch and Alim teamed up.